Well, good morning, my friends, and I thank God that you are my friends. We have been building a friendship, and you remember I told you on the first day, my usual friends and family are thousands of miles away, and I'm going to need you to be my family and my friends, and so this sermon today 
is straight out of the scripture and the life of the Apostle Paul, who is a great model of mine. And this one's for you, my friends. And the title of today's message, the last one in this summer of ministry that has been my great privilege to share with you here, the title is Forever Friends. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20. Reading out of the New Living Translation, Paul is speaking to his friends in Thessalonica. And he says, after all, what gives us hope and joy and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns, it is you. Yes, he says, you are our pride and joy. So when I think about Paul's declaring that they're not only his friends now, but they will be his friends forever. I think of one of my dearest friends on this earth, who is not now on this earth, but for many years he was one of my dearest friends. Olin Brandstetter was a remarkable and strong individual. He was a graduate of Oklahoma State University, which is the one that partnered with your emperor, and may I be bold enough to say after three months here, our emperor, Haile Selassie. He was a proud graduate of Oklahoma State University. He grew up on a ranch in western Oklahoma, and he partially earned his way through college riding bulls for money in rodeos. He later became an oil man, a state senator, and one of the greatest fans and supporters of Oklahoma State University. He lived large. He once said, I refuse to tiptoe through life only to arrive at death safely. You can understand why Olin and I formed a bond of friendship. When I turned 40, which does seem like quite a few years ago, but I still remember the day my wife said, well, your 40th birthday is coming up. How do you want to celebrate it? And I said, you fix your famous homemade tacos and invite Olin and his wife to come up from the town where we once served the church they're now part of and invite them to come and be our guests. And so they did. Just the two couples sitting down at the table together to eat some wonderful food, a little feast for four. Then Olin took hold of a little sack, a little festive birthday gift sack, handed it to me and said, we've got something for you. And so as I reached down into the bottom of that sack, I found a wonderful pocket knife. It was called an Uncle Henry knife. I had never had one before. I did not even realize that they were famous for the guarantee on the Uncle Henry knife. But he said, open up the box and read the guarantee. And I was astonished to find that I now had a knife that was guaranteed against being lost by any means whatsoever. Olin said, John, you understand if you're out fishing and drop this knife accidentally over the side, you can write to Uncle Henry and say, I lost my knife. It's at the bottom of a lake. They will send you another one. He said, if you're struck by lightning and you survive, but your knife does not, they will send you another one. It's guaranteed against any loss. And so I was pretty proud of that. I had sure never had a knife like that before. Then he said, if you look under the Uncle Henry guarantee, you'll find my guarantee. So I pulled out their guarantee and I found a little slip of paper on which my friend Olin had written, my friendship is like this knife. It is guaranteed against ever being lost. You can't lose my friendship. 
And so when I think of forever friendship, I always think of Olin, a knife and a friendship with a guarantee the likes of which I had never had before. And so from now on, when I think of forever friendship, I will think of you and I will think of the Apostle Paul and his forever friends in Thessalonica. Because in these few verses that we read together, Paul declares an eternal friendship with these dear forever friends in Thessalonica. And we will see that it is a friendship that was rooted in the past, that was sustaining him in the present as he wrote to them from afar. And other than being in the presence of Jesus, he declares that they will be his greatest joy forever when he arrives in heaven. Let's look at that first tense of this friendship. It was rooted in the past. Acts 17, 1 through 9, if you want to read it sometime, tells the beginning of that friendship, the story of Paul's brief time of ministry in Thessalonica. The parallels to our situation here in Addis today are striking. It was the largest city of Macedonia. And incidentally, I met a couple here several weeks ago for which Macedonia was the home country of the lady in this couple. Thessalonica was the largest city in Macedonia. It was the capital city of its providence. Its province. It was a bustling center of trade and communication. It was a key and strategic place for the spread of the gospel, as is Addis and this church. And through the time together, though it was brief, they had built some history together that was like that unbreakable threefold cord that the scripture speaks about in that that friendship was woven in the past out of three wonderful things, all of which I have found in my time here in these last three months. It begins with a wonderful welcome to a little band of travelers who had come a great distance on assignment from heaven to do some work for God. 1 Thessalonians 1.9 says, They, that is people everywhere else, they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us. And I think you already understand you are legendary with my friends back home. I brag on you every week. I send pictures. I send stories. And my friends back home indeed can't quit talking about the welcome that has been given to me. And then the second strand in that unbreakable cord of friendship is loving deeds. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 in the New Living Translation says, as we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. You, my friends, have shared your food, your wisdom, your time, your culture. You've given me rides, fixed my hearing aids, spoken priceless words, of encouragement and humored my obsession about boring into every corner of the history and the culture of this place that is now one of my homes and will be forever loving deeds indeed have filled my days because of you. And then the third strand in that cord of unbreakable Friendship is found in chapter 2, verse 8, and that is a mutual sharing of not just ministry, but of, quote, our very lives. The message, paraphrase, puts it this way. 
not content to just pass on the message. We wanted to give you our hearts, and we did. In other words, we've been ourselves with one another. There's an old country saying that I only heard about of a lady who stood up in a country church to testify, and she said, folks, I just am what I am, and I can't be no ammer. That's been my determination to be who I am. And you have chosen to love me just as I am. And so we have been transparent with one another, you and I. And transparency builds friendships. You can't really have a true relationship. You can't really have a friendship with somebody who's trying to pretend to be something they are not. And that's what 1 John is speaking about in verses 3 and 7 of chapter 1, where we read, Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. On day one, I told you I needed you to be my friends and my family, and you have done that wonderfully well. We have opened our hearts to one another. We have walked in the light a full disclosure of who we really are. And we have become dear friends along the way. So that was the history that they had lived with one another. And that is the history that you and I have lived together these last three months. And so because it was based on reality, and it wove that three-stranded cord of unbreakable friendship, it is still, still sustaining him in the present as he has moved on down the road. He has been run out of Thessalonica, gone to Berea, been run out of Berea. He has had some hard traveling, which is a theme that we find in a couple of songs that are well known to, to some of us in America. Woody Guthrie, a famous troubadour son of Oklahoma, wrote a song that said, I've been having some hard traveling. And so Paul has been having some hard traveling, but it is giving him hope and joy as he has landed in Corinth where he has spent he has been spending a considerable time in ministry. But thinking back to those friendships in the past that continue in the present are giving strength to Paul as he continues his life in Greece and he continues his ministry. And you can read about that whole story in Acts chapter 18 verses 1 through 16. And I assure you that long after I have traveled the many miles back home in a few days, you will not just be in my past, my friends, you will be in my present. I promise you this. He says in the present tense, in the first part of chapter 2, verse 19, what gives us hope and joy? What is filling my heart right now, he says, with hope. And it is primarily because he knows that the seed he planted in Thessalonica has found good soil to grow in, and therefore it will produce an eternal harvest. We don't much care how hard we work for God to do what he assigns us to do, if we believe it will produce an eternal harvest. And in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, New Living Translation, Paul says a wonderful thing about his ministry among the Thessalonians. 
He says, quote, Therefore we never stop thanking God that when you received his ministry, his message through us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. Remember our scripture for rainy season? It was found in Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. And even though we've been unusually blessed with sunny and warmer days than we had any reason to expect or deserve, nevertheless, I love this passage that says basically, as the rain comes down, but it doesn't do it without putting something into the ground that causes it to bud and flourish and bring about a harvest. So it is with God's word. It will not return unto him void, but it will accomplish what he sends it to accomplish. And I have seen evidence every single week that your hearts are the good soil in which God's word is germinating and it's growing as you meditate on it. You talk about it in your community groups. You are incorporating it into your lives. And some of you reminded me of things that we've been talking about like we have enjoyed becoming with you. And indeed, you are becomers as we have followed Jesus and he has made us to become by stages, day by day, what he sees us eventually becoming. So I can't help but think today of Galatians 6, 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And I promise you, I am fainting not, and I am full of hope because of what God's Word is accomplishing in you because you have allowed it to be what God sent it to become. But he says, not only you're our hope, but you're our joy. You're our pride and joy. I love that. 1 Thessalonians 2.20 Just you being you gives me joy. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. People who give us joy give us strength. And I thank you for both. I thank you that I wake up every morning and swing around and drop my feet on the floor and say, thank God I'm an Addis and thank you for the people who are making it a joy to be here every single day. Paul's had many difficulties, but friends like these keep him going and keep him regarding any difficulty as a light affliction because of the incredible rewards. Now I've told you over the last couple of weeks about my list of friends that turned things around during a dark and difficult time in my life. But I had a full page of names of friends that I could count on and they could count on me. I've told you about how Jesus, it may have not been written down, but Jesus had his list of friends he had his disciples. He had three of them who were especially close. Peter, James, and John. He had three in Bethany that sustained him in the dark hours leading up to Calvary. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And if we begin to ask ourselves, what kept Paul going? You read those passages. Been through shipwreck. Been run out of more towns than I can count. Been through every kind of difficulty. Left for dead a time or two. But Romans 16, the closing chapter of that incredible book filled with doctrine that is so basic, it's still considered the basic scriptures to teach somebody about how to become a follower of Jesus. Some call it the Romans road to salvation. Romans 3, 23, 6, 23, and so forth, full of doctrine. And some people 
probably look at this last chapter and think it's just a bunch of names. What's that about? Why is that in the Bible? And I'll tell you why. It's because that's what kept Paul going. Those people. That's his list. I, I like that about Paul. He made a list. He checked it twice. And he never, never forgot that what kept him going, according to Acts 16, you know what it was? Priscilla and Aquila, Eponidas, Mary, Andronicus, Julia, Ampliatus, Urbanus, Stachus, Apellus, Aristobulus, Herodian, Narcissus, Tryphena, Tryphosa. There's a couple of sisters for you. Persis, Rufus, Rufus's mother, Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, and so on and on and on. 27 names plus all the believers in five different home groups. Why is it in there? Well, since all scriptures inspired and Paul was inspired to write it and the Holy Spirit saw to it that the words were not lost, they're in our Bibles forever to remind us we need people. People are precious. People are one of the greatest gifts from God. And so I say, thank you, Paul, for putting those names there and reminding me that it's all these people before me and all those names and all the people they stand for that have just kept me going with joy and enthusiasm every single day. But we don't, this is the great thing about this unusual passage of Paul's that we don't just have a past and a present because it's forever. If we're friends in Jesus and we're on our way to heaven, it's forever. I told you about the gift from my friend Olin. I told you about the double guarantees at the bottom of the box in the bottom of the bag. 27 years after that gift, the friendship was still intact and I still had the knife. I have never had a knife for 27 years. But this one that was guaranteed against loss, I never lost. I treasured it too much. I almost headed into an airport with it one time and I turned around and walked all the way back to my car to put that knife in the car. I was not letting some security guard throw that knife in a trash can. 27 years later, I was 500 miles away representing pastor care ministry at a huge Promise Keepers convention. When I got a phone call from another friend in the same town, Ponca City, Oklahoma, said, John, not sure if you're aware, but Olin is having his 80th birthday tomorrow night in the Brandsetter home. And we just know it would make his day if you could be there. And I said, I'm 500 miles away, but I will be there. So I went back to the booth and told my friend who was helping me man that booth, when we're done today, we're done in Denver. We're packing it up. We're going to bed early. We're riding before dawn. We're going to be at Olin's birthday party. So we arrived in Ponca City. We made our way to the familiar address on Virginia Street. The house was full. The party had started. We made our way in. And I stood across a crowded dining room with a table with a cake on it in the middle. And I saw Olin on the other side of the crowd. And I reached into my pocket and I came out with that knife and I held it up and showed it to Olin and said, Olin, I've still got the knife. And Olin smiled at me and said, and you've still got my friendship. You've still got it and it's guaranteed forever. And I said, yes, till death do us part. And my friend, who was very precise about language, said, Oh no, John, 
It's not just till death do us part. It's forever. Even after death has entered the picture, you've got my friendship. And two and a half years after that, I was standing in that home church in Ponca City to conduct the funerals for Olin and his wife, who had been flying a couple of coaches of Oklahoma State University on a recruiting trip when in a storm the plane went down and took with it two of the dearest friends that my wife and I had ever had or ever will have. But I held the knife up in that service and said, I've still got the friendship as well as the knife. Make some friends in Jesus so that we have got friends forever when we get to heaven. When we get to heaven, what will be the starring attractions? Some of the songs that I've heard through the years have suggested that the biggest thing might be, hey, I'm in heaven now. I want to see the streets of gold. I want to see those mansions. I want to hear an angel choir singing. I want to hear what heavenly harps sound like. But according to Paul, when he gets to heaven, I mean, he's a man who knew his Bible. If anybody was going to be getting to heaven and saying, well, I want to see David. I want to see Moses. I want to see Elijah. I want to see these heroes of bygone days. But no, that's not what he says. What's our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing when we get to heaven? Is it not you? <laughs> I love that. Paul's saying, well, there's a lot of great people up here I've heard about. I'm looking forward to seeing them. But right now I want to know where are the Thessalonica folks. <laughs> I'm just dying to see them. So when I see you in heaven, it'll give me more cause for rejoicing than seeing Peter or Paul or streets of gold or mansions or gates of pearl or any of those other things. It will be you. Matthew 19, 29 in the NIV says, words that have been taking on new significance for me, though I've read them a whole lot of times, but I've never taken it so personally before when Paul, when Matthew says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children, all of which I t left temporarily three months ago. But he says, If you've left these for my sake, you'll receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. I left these things for a few months. But my family and I have according to this scripture, which I am absolutely standing on, we have gained in you a hundredfold return. And if I don't see you again on this earth, I guarantee you, with an eternal guarantee, we will be forever friends in heaven. God bless you. And I'll either see you again here or I'll see you there. But the friendship is for keeps. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.